December 8, 2008, regular monthly meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Uh, before we get underway with our regular uh, agenda, we do have the installation of our new uh, school board members and town council members. So I would ask the clerk uh, to step to the front, and I call up uh, first the, the new school board members or returning school board members. We have Linda Winker, Kathy Ray, and Mary Townsend. And Kathy apparently is not here tonight. We'll have to swear in her, uh, swear her in, or swear at her. One or the other. Congratulations, Linda and Mary. Thank you. Now I would ask, uh, they already know, Ann Swift Kayata and Dave Sherman, the new members of, uh, one returning and one new member of our town council. Welcome, David, and welcome back, Ann. I now ask the clerk uh, to read the roll call, please. Councilor Rowe? Here. Councilor Backer? Here. Councilor Lennon? Here. Councilor McKinney? Here. Councilor Sherman? Here. And Councilor Swift Kayata? Here. Thank you. And I would now ask everyone to rise and join me in a pledge of allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, Town Council reports and correspondence. Um, I just wanted to report that the Library Study Committee is continuing to meet and we've visited uh, more libraries and there has, Critical Insights has completed a survey, of uh, a telephone survey, and so things are moving along and we will be delivering a report uh, sometime in 2009, in the first half of 2009. Thank you, Ann. Sure. Reports and correspondence, Sarah? Uh, the Ordinance Committee, just a quick update. We took up the bed and breakfast issue um, at our meeting on December 4th, and um, I think it's fair to say we reached a consensus, although we didn't vote because Dave was not yet sworn in. Um, we're hoping to have a quick vote at our meeting on December 15th when we're going to take up the um, discussion of possible BA district zoning changes. It's at um, 8 o'clock in the morning on the second floor in the planning office. Monday the 15th, and of course, everyone's invited to attend. Um, alternative energy, 
Uh, they are working very, very hard to finish their report, which is due this month, as you know. And um, it's almost done, and it's a great, great report. Uh, the members of that committee have put in an enormous amount of work, all of them, um, traveling around the state, meeting with people, going to um, conferences, and each submitting sections to make up the report. Um, Bill Slack, who's the um, head of the committee, has worked extra, extra hard and is putting the final touches on the report now, and he hopes to get it to us by the end of this month. In fact, he's committed to do that, and I hope it will be in our packets for our January meeting, and he would like to come and do a really quick presentation to sum up what they've found. Thanks, Sarah. Other reports and correspondence? I have uh, just a couple quick items. Um, First, the Cumberland County Budget Advisory Committee has finished its work for another year. Uh, I've really appreciated the opportunity to serve on that group. Uh, the end result of the committee's work this year was to recommend a net tax effect uh, increase of 2.65% over the current year. Uh, th this was something I wasn't 100% happy with, but uh, given that over the past eight years our, our uh, county assessment has risen by over 73%, I at least felt it was a move in the right direction. Uh, the county budget will actually be decided by our three county commissioners. They are Mallory Shaughnessy, uh, Esther Clenet, and from our own district two, uh, Commissioner Dick Feeney. And they will be deciding uh, what the budget will be within the next few weeks. The other item I wanted to mention was that I experienced the joy of having my first ceremonial appearance as town council chairman this past weekend. Uh, I was invited to cut the ribbon for the official reopening of the uh, so-called Great Pond uh, Boardwalk and Bridge. If you haven't already seen this, you really need to get over there to see it. It's on the east end of, of Great Pond, uh, near where Alewise Brook flows out of Great Pond. It's nearly 1,000 feet of boardwalk skirting the wetlands uh, of the uh, east end of the pond. Um, with our Conservation committee, Commission uh, leading the way, this was a cooperative effort between private citizens, private uh, contractors, and indeed all those citizens uh, of nearly the past 400 years who have kept the vision alive for an access accessible Great Pond. And I'd encourage you, I think at this point, to, uh, if you haven't already read the uh, History of Cape Elizabeth, Maine by William B. Jordan, Jr., it was uh, published in 1965. Go to Thomas Memorial Library and pick it up, and uh, you'll find a whole in very interesting story about public access at Great Pond. Um, that's all I have. Um, so we will move forward uh, with citizen opportunity for discussion of items not on the agenda tonight. And I think we do have some citizens here. Uh, if you would uh, announce your, uh, your name and your address, and. Uh, Try to keep the remarks to uh, th three minutes or under, please. Uh, my name is Edward Matterson. I live at 2 Charles Road, Cape Elizabeth. I'm co-chairman of the North Shore Neighborhood Association, which is dedicated to preserving the residential quality, among other things, of our neighborhood. The most immediate issue we are dealing with is the potential rezoning of 553 Shore Road uh, from residential to business. 553 is a historic and lovely residence and has always been a residence. We do not see the rezoning of this property as business to be in the best interests of our neighborhood nor in the best interests of Cape Elizabeth. The property was purchased as residential and should remain so. What is called the Shore Road BA zone on the comprehensive plan can hardly be considered a business zone capable of expansion without serious detriment to the surrounding residences. Uh, I would personally invite you as towns, town councilors to visit our area and see the physical limitations of the Shore Road VA zone. Please feel free to contact my wife or myself in this regard. Uh, my neighbor, David Sanford, whose well-maintained property literally embraces 553, can speak more personally regarding the negative effect any business development there would have on his home. And uh, we have a number of people who share my view uh, or join us here tonight. Very yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Uh, my name is David Sanford. I live at One Child's Road. Uh, we're a direct to butter to 553 Shore Road. <clears throat> my wife Joyce and I are among the undeserving few who get to leave uh, 
Maine in the winter. So uh, we, we will be away until the end of April, and this is our sole opportunity to, uh, although we've written email and we'll probably write more, this, this is our sole opportunity to sort of get up and speak at, about uh, our opposition to 553 Shore Road. If you stand in front of the house at 553 Shore Road, you can see how someone might promote it as a business location. However, if you look at the house from behind, as I wish that you would, standing on our side porch at 1 Charles Road, or even better, down the driveway near the garage, or behind the garage where there is no separation whatsoever between our yard and the 553 garage, you will see how big the building is from the back how it looms over the neighborhood, and how accurate it is to say that 553 Shore Road is embedded in a residential neighborhood, where every house is very close to every other house. <clears throat> For good reason, businesses are located with other businesses, in a business district, or with plenty of reassuring space around them, if they're in an area with lots of homes. Businesses bring noise, traffic, transient comings and goings, hustle bustle, and disruption. All fine if you're out shopping, but decidedly not fine if you're looking for privacy, peace, and quiet in your own home. Many of the people in our small, compact neighborhood have lived here for decades. Joyce and I have been here for 26 years, and I'm sure that some people, some people still regard us as newcomers. People who have settled into their homes and their neighborhood, as the people in our neighborhood have, have every right to be distressed at the prospect of one of those houses, the biggest of all of them, becoming open for business. We want the integrity of our neighborhood to be respected. That is why we are cheered by the fact that Jane Wayne and Nicholas, the owner of 551 Shore Road, and a member of our neighborhood association is petitioning the town to change her zoning from business back to the residential zoning that until recently she's always thought that she had. I think it's, it's worth noting that on one side of 553 Shore Road, 551 Shore Road is a residence. On the other side, 1 Charles Road, our home is a residence. The next house in the road down Shore Road, 5. 79 Shore Road, the Bazell's house, is a residence. Every single house on Charles Road is a residence. Every single house on Warren Avenue is a residence. There is nothing wrong with a commercial intention like the one that the owner of 553 Shore Road has, except when that intention wishes to express itself in a tiny business area where there is no physical room for growth except by converting handsome hundred-year-old homes, where a business building such as she has in mind seriously disrupts a residential neighborhood, where no, not one of the residents of the neighborhood wants it, where it meets no discernible neighborhood need, and where it is revenue neutral and doesn't benefit the town at all. The whole consideration of expanding the VA district in our area amounts to little more than the effort of one person to get her residence own business. We regard that as a very bad idea and hope that the council rejects it. Thank you for your open-mindedness and for giving our point of view your serious consideration. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Sanford. Uh, my name is Emily Madison. I live at 2 Charles Road, which is across the street from David and Joy Sanford. <laughs> And I live beside the Brazels, who live at 579 Shore Road. Uh, you've heard us describe the property at 553 Shore Road, and now I'd like to hear you hear how the owner of that property describes it. I can't read this without my glasses, but I know that it says, this is from VRBO, which is Vacation Rentals by Owner, if any of you are familiar with that website. She describes this house as being in a quiet, quaint neighborhood. She does not say it's in a business area. She refers to businesses and restaurants down the street, and by that she means South Portland because we have no restaurants in that part of Cape Elizabeth. So she is calling it a neighborhood that this house is in. 
as well as we say it's a neighborhood. And I just wanted you to be aware of that. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Matterson. Others who would like to speak on items not on the agenda? <clears throat> uh, Harry Hardy, 6 Charles Road. I've been there for 36 years. Uh, this is probably the only opportunity I'm going to have to speak to this issue because I'm going to be leaving in mid-January for three months. But I'm opposed to, to rezoning that address. I, uh, you know, I've thought about this. I've walked around. I've looked at everything. And it just you know, it makes absolutely no sense to me, none whatsoever. And I can't really speak for my neighbors, but I have the neighbors on one side the Trianos who have been in their home for 50 years, uh, the uh, Freemans at Agley Cross have been there 30 years. Between the three households, we've been there for 116 years and we like what we have and we don't want to lose it. And uh, I, I'm just opposed to rezoning and I don't know, I know uh, Jim Rose who has been here long enough to remember uh, the variety store that was two buildings up from that, the first building in Cape Elizabeth, and for the first 10 or 12 years that I lived in the Cape, that variety store as a business was active, and that was a horror show every single weekend. And, and I hope, you know, I hope we protect ourselves against that sort of thing again. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Hardy. Other citizens who would like to speak on items not on the agenda this evening? Seeing none, we'll move on with the agenda. And I would ask the uh, town manager to give his report, please. Uh, thank you. i just find it here for a second. Another 15 seconds, Jim. I can get to that little crowd. circle. Hmm? You're losing your crowd. Oh, I <laughs> doesn't surprise me. If you'd gotten it up sooner, I would have stayed. <laughs> skipping around like that. There we go. Well, it's the, the first slide went off. Anyway, I uh, wanted to sh show that the first slide, for what, whatever reason, didn't go, but there's been a number of projects that have been ongoing lately, and I wanted to show them. Uh, Jim mentioned a few of them at the beginning of the meeting, but first of all, this is what's, what's left of the slide at the, uh, as, as uh, the cursor was moving it, at the uh, entrance to Port Williams. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of really positive comments about what went on at the entrance of Fort Williams, but it's also a little bit frustrating. People say, why are you waiting, wasting tax dollars? And I wanted to underline exclamation point. There are no tax dollars involved in that, this particular project. Uh, it was all paid for by funding uh, by the museum at Portland Headlight Gift Shop, which means that it was supported in large part by the volunteers at the Lighthouse, who, because of their work, were able to make the profits, and particularly by the customers who, uh, who uh, spend money at the gift shop. The gift shop, in a good year, does $500,000 worth of business a year. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's not the profit, but it, it, it does uh, fairly well. Uh, as you can see, there's some beautiful masonry done by, uh, this was done by uh, the, the lead contractor was Lebrecht Construction. Uh, the Burns Fencing did that, the new fence. Tom Memory, a local Cape Elizabeth resident, was the one that designed, uh, designed those particular improvements. Uh, we also, in this past month, have had the bleachers and the, the coach's box completed down at uh, Hannaford Field. Uh, this is a, during the construction of it. And again, this was, uh, this was joint funding uh, by the Kids Turf Group, a, a lot of voluntary donations, as well as by the town of Cape Elizabeth. It was about a, th a project of about $330,000. Uh, the Kids Turf donated 180000 and the town included in its in its bond issue 150,000, and uh, you know the this was the bleachers actually before the, the coach's box went up, 
but you can see that they're, they're very substantial and if anyone went to the football game that was there and went or for any other event has been there and has walked to the top of the bleachers it's it's really tremendous uh, the view you have of the activity in the field and someone mentioned to me as well that the, the great thing about these bleachers compared to some in some other neighboring communities which I won't mention are the bleachers are really on top of the field there's another one in a neighboring community where you have the field then you have a track and then you have a 20-foot setback these ones are right on top of the field so it really gives a good opportunity for citizens and and visitors to see the field um, Jim mentioned uh, a new boardwalk down by Great Pond and a ribbon cutting this was uh, that's Jim in the foreground uh, before he actually cut the ribbon you can see it was it was a it was as he mentioned a ceremonial occasion but the attendance was not tremendous uh, the rest of the people are off the rest of the people <laughs> <laughs> There were a number of people, but you can see th this boardwalk, uh, it was originally actually a Rotary Club project that put in the original boardwalk that was gone in the, in the muck there, but boards in the muck don't survive. Uh, and this is uh, Great Northern Docks was contracted to do this work, and this involves a, a beautiful, you know, fairly lengthy boardwalk uh, that looks like this, very safe to walk on, and enables folks to get, without this, there was no legal way to get from the mouth of the Alewife Brook back to Crescent Beach because you would be trust you'd be either down in the muck or you'd be trespassing on someone else's property. Uh, along with some ongoing negotiations that the town has been having with uh, the land trust has actually been having with Jody Jordan, uh, that's on dry land that avoids something like this, it would give the ability to connect all those different pieces. So fairly significant. This was funded by the, uh, by the town of Cape Elizabeth as part of the bond issue monies were set aside for trail work the conservation commission recommended this to the council as their top priority uh, this is the view from a little bridge that's part of that boardwalk where it actually crosses where great pond and ale white brook come together and for those of you that have never been down in there you can see this is the view looking down ale white brook back towards the ocean you look the other side you've got beautiful great pond all in front of you but it really gives you a sense of uh, even you know during the late fall with just a beautiful beautiful area uh, that is down there uh, for those of you that were down there there was all this there was a hill that you, you usually fell down in order to to get down to the bottom a, a really steep hill uh, part of this work was skip murray put in these new uh, stone steps and then he, he noted there was a railing and uh, that was all added they found some trees and pounded the pounded those logs or whatever they are uh, into the uh, ground and uh, you know just that enables you to get down to where that boardwalk is but another example I think of the community working together and you know a lot of those things were partnerships and you look at this we have new dugouts at Holman Field and Capano Field a hundred percent donated uh, by the Diamond Club by folks who donated the Diamond Club uh, John Thibodeau and uh, uh, Roger Boyington and others uh, oversaw that effort but you know all, all citizen driven all again privately paid for for those of you that have seen uh, over and back of the uh, police station that structure going up in the playground again that was money raised by the, the middle school parents association working with uh, uh, Kate Land Trust uh, made a contribution even Portland Trails made a contribution to that Pat Carroll a local architect uh, volunteered services as well to design that but again, a, a totally parent-driven uh, uh, activity and 100% funded uh, by donations. Uh, the planning board this past month granted the, the permit for the, the proposed early phases of the Fort Williams Park Arboretum. Again, to be proposed for totally citizen-funded, uh, no taxes. There's an item uh, later on, Nordic track planning uh, over on the Gullcrest property. Uh, again, all, just about all that work uh, has been you know, raised, raised from citizens. Uh, the holiday decorations uh, that have gone up, all the wreaths donated by the Cape Elizabeth Garden Club. You look at the library and all the landscaping that was done out there in the last few years. I'm just trying to make the point, and particularly one of the items that you, you have on your agenda later on is thanking citizens and, and others who have donated things to the community. An awful lot of positive things that are happening uh, are being done because citizens have been extremely generous not only with their money, but their time as well. Uh, you know, uh, Jim mentioned Gus Barber uh, passing it. Uh, actually, I, 
at the beginning of the last meeting, it was, it was mentioned, I believe. And, you know, Gus was another one. He, he not only gave the money for the cliff walk at Fort Williams as, as it began, but he also had the vision for it. And so many of the things is the vision. So and I think even in these tough economic times, and I'll be talking about something else later on here, I think it's important to note that we can still get a lot of things accomplished. Uh, and it's not always with tax dollars and it's people working together. So I want to thank all of those involved with these different projects and uh, uh, say that, you know, it really, I think, what makes Cape Elizabeth a fine community. So. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Mike. Ditto that. Uh, we will now review the minutes of the meetings held on November 10th and November 20th, please. I would uh, entertain motions. Ann? Um, I would move that we approve the minutes of the meetings held November 10th and 20th, but I do have a couple of corrections or changes. So noted. Second. We have a so, motion and second. Uh, Ann, would you like to bring sure. the changes forward? The first change that I have is for the minutes of um, November 10th, and that would be on page 6, item number 140. And it says, it, this had to do with the town center intersection, it said, moved by Councillor Backer and seconded by Councillor Lennon and uh, that it, it was the tabling motion, six yes, zero no. As I recall, the way it happened was that Councillor Backer and then, uh, moved and then Councillor Lennon seconded a motion to not do the light, to decline the PACS money and to reimburse MDOT. There was discussion going on. All six of us, six of the councillors made points. The last one to speak was Councillor Rowe and then he made a motion to table, which was seconded by Councillor McKenney, and then that vote was 6-0 to table the item until May of 2009. So I have that same recollection now that you mention it. So I, I think that needs to be changed. And then the second um, thing I had a question about was for the minutes on, of uh, November 20th. Item number 147, the personnel code amendments. It says moved by Councillor McKinney, McKinney, seconded by Councillor Lennon, uh, but I don't see any vote. I, I believe, I'm, I think it's it down below, five yes, zero. Oh, okay, I missed it. So ignore that one. Okay. Other uh, corrections, additions, deletions? I just have a question. If I was not present at those meetings because I was not yet on the council, do I vote on the minutes nevertheless? Okay. Um, yes. It's a, yes. It's a ministerial responsibility. Okay. Fair enough. No other corrections? Uh, all in favor of the uh, motion, including amendment? Any opposition? Show it to be unanimous, please. Now we'll start, a, start our agenda. Um, item number 1-2009, uh, election of a town council chairman for council year 2009. Ann? Um, I would move that um, James S. Rowe be elected our town council chair for the council year 2009. A second motion. Moved and seconded. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none. All in favor? Go to be six zero, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, looking at the, the next several items, what, I'm, what I would like to propose is that we do uh, items two, three, four, and five separately, and then maybe we we'll, might want to consider doing the, the remainder of the uh, appointments list and block, but just give it some thought for now. We'll, we'll move on with item two dash 2009. The adoption of the town council rules. David? I move the adoption of the amended town council rules um, as presented. Moved. Second. And seconded. Councillor Swift Kayada. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none. All in favor? Six zero. 
Uh, item number 3-2009, appointment of the Finance Committee. Do I hear a motion? David? I move the appointment of Ann Swift Kayata as um, chairman and the council as a whole to serve as the Finance Committee for the upcoming fiscal year. Second. Ooh. And seconded by Councilor Lennon. Discussion? All in favor? 6 0. Uh, appointment of an ordinance committee. Paul? I move that Sarah Lennon, uh, that uh, we appoint Sarah Lennon as chairman and David Backer and David Sherman as members. Moved. Second. And seconded by Councillor Swift Kayata. Discussion? All in favor? 6 0. Item number 4 2009. Uh, excuse me, item number 5-2009, appointment of an appointments committee. Ann? I uh, move that Paul McKenney be appointed chair and that Ann Swift Kayata and one additional member to be named after the election in January um, serve as the appointments committee. Second. Move and seconded by Councillor Sherman. Discussion? All in favor? 6-0. Um, I, Swift yes, I'd like to move that we take items um, 6 through 14 in a block. Move that items 6 through 14 be considered en bloc. Second. Second. Seconded by everybody. Uh, discussion? We will consider. Uh, all, all in favor of doing that. 6-0. Uh, we will consider items 6 through 14 now uh, in one vote. We have the appointment of an appointments committee. Uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, we have an appointment of the representatives to the EcoMain Board of Directors, uh, Manager McGovern, and one representative to be named in the February 20, 2009 meeting. We have an uh, appointment of representative to the Greater Portland Council of Government's Executive Committee, uh, Councilor McKenney. We have appointment of representative and alternate uh, to the Greater Portland Council of Government's General Assembly. Uh, myself with Councillor Backer being the alternate. We have appointment of representative to the PACS Policy Committee. Uh, Manager McGovern will, will be that. Uh, appointment of representative to the Maine Municipal Association Legislative Policy Committee. Councillor Swift Kayata. Appointment of representatives to the Thomas Memorial Library Foundation. Uh, Councillor Backer to serve in that position until a replacement is chosen in February 2009. Uh, we have an appointment of representative to the Thomas Memorial Library Study Committee, Councillor Swift Kayata. We have an appointment for representative to the Alternative Energy Committee, uh, Councillor Lennon. We have an appointment of representative to the Shore Road Pathway Study Committee, uh, Councillor Backer. Do I have a motion? to uh, approve those appointments. So moved. Second. Moved by Councillor McKenney, seconded by Councillor swift Kayata. Discussion on the motion. All in favor of those appointments? Short to be unanimous. Thank you. Uh, we will now hold a uh, public hearing on the town ways ordinance. This was brought to the council uh, last month and referred to hearing this evening. Uh, hopefully you'll have had a chance to review the uh, proposed ordinance. Uh, it basically has come from our uh, town code enforcement officer, who public re works uh, excuse me, public works director who reviewed the uh, existing ordinance, sorry Bob, uh, and has come forward with the uh, ordinance as proposed. Do I have a motion? Oh, I'm sorry. I would move that we open the public, or I will open the public hearing. How's that? Public hearing on the town ways ordinance. Those who would like to speak may come forward now. Now. <laughs> and now. Okay. We'll close the public hearing. We will now hold a, uh, a vote on the town ways ordinance. Do I hear a motion? David? I move that we adopt the proposed amendments to the town ways ordinance. Second. Move and seconded by the councillors to my right. Uh, discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? 
Uh, item number 16 is appointments uh, committee recommendations. Now we look to our outgoing or, or immediate past uh, appointments committee chairman, uh, Ann swift -Kad. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Deborah Lane, who staffs this committee every year, and she does an excellent job of uh, pulling together all the information needed uh, for those of us on the committee. Um, and I want to thank Paul McKenney and David Backer and Jim Rowe, who, who filled in uh, at one of the meetings um, for their help in uh, choosing amongst the very, the very many excellent candidates that we had for open positions on town boards and commissions. We were in the enviable position of having many more well-qualified candidates than we had openings. And I thank everyone for applying and, um, I, uh, and being willing to serve the town. For those who are not going to be appointed in a few minutes to open positions, I urge you to uh, apply again in the future. There are many people serving on current boards and commissions who didn't get onto a board or commission on their first try because, as I said, we are lucky to have so many people in this community who are willing to volunteer. That being said, I would like to uh, nominate the following folks uh, for new terms on boards and commissions. For the Board of Assessment Review, John McAniff. For Arts Commission, Janesta Berry and Janice Reale. Um, we also, I should note, have one further opening on the Arts Commission, which we have been um, advertising for, but we don't have that person as of now. But uh, the next, uh, our, the next appointments committee will be handling that appointment. For Community Services Advisory Commission, we are appointing to the three town slots Susan Haversat for a term that lasts until 2010, um, Jean Ginmarvin for a term that lasts until the end of 2011, and Bill Marshall for a term that lasts until 2011. For Conservation Commission, Richard Bauman, and John Planensek. For the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, Bill Brownell, Maureen McCarthy, Bill Nickerson. For the Personnel Appeals Board, Carol Fritz. For the Planning Board, Liza Quinn to serve a term till 12-31-2009, and then Peter Hatem and Jim Hubner for terms that, uh, until December 31st, 2011. For Recycling Committee, for a term ending 12-31-2009, William Wadman. And for terms ending 12-31-2011, David Ernst and John Kane. For the Riverside Memorial Cemetery Trustees, Jerry Sherry. For the Thomas Memorial Library Trustees, Virginia Cantera and Jessica Sullivan. For the Zoning Board of Appeals, Peter Black and John Thibodeau. So again, I thank everyone who volunteered and everyone who is going to be serving, and I also thank those who are not going to be able to serve, but encourage you to reapply. So I will uh, turn that all into a motion to appoint these folks. Moved it. Seconded. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor of the appointments uh, as read by Councilor Scopiata. Please let me finish before you raise your hand. <laughs> Kidding. Six all. Six all. You scared me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and thanks to you, Ann, and, and the rest of the appointments committee for the great work. It's, uh, I, as Ann said, I had an opportunity to sit in on a couple of the sessions, and uh, it's interesting meeting the people and finding out what a wealth of experience we have in our community. Item 17-2009. Uh, suggested pedestrian safety measures in town center, and I will ask the, uh, the manager to, uh, to comment on this item, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Jim. The, at the last council meeting, there was a lot of discussion in the town center intersection, town center intersection, I think it was the last regular meeting, and there was also, there was a discussion that the staff ought to look at some suggestions to help out in the short term, uh, particularly as it relates to pedestrian safety. 
So we looked, we looked at it, we met with a few different citizens who had diff different ideas, particularly residents in the immediate area, and we have nine recommendations. Uh, the Chief of Police was, is here this evening to answer questions on any of these. Bob uh, Malley's here as well. Uh, the first recommendation uh, is to take the, the high, where the high school light is and have a new signalized crosswalk across Route 77 that's tied into that light. We have an awful lot more kids now coming down Old, Old Ocean House Road. It's a fairly new phenomena mm -hmm. for the last two years, coming down that way on bikes and walking and then having to get over the high school side. This would enable them to uh, be able to get across uh, safely. Again, it would be tied into the existing traffic light. Install in-road stanchions. These are in the middle of the road at the Key Bank crosswalk and at the Town Hall crosswalk that would read state law, yield to pedestrians within crosswalks, or same message partially with pictographs. It's, you know, they, they, so they come with pictographs. Uh, three, provide a bucket of red flags at either side of the of these three crosswalks for individuals to carry from one side of the road to the other. Uh, some people have seen this, you, you pick it up in one bucket, you cross, you, you dump it on the other side, hopefully they come out fairly even. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> number four, enhance the painting of each crosswalk so they're more prominent. Uh, we have rather limited painting on the crosswalks. Install six signs indicating no passing in the bike lane. One of the concerns expressed is that a lot of people are or there'll be a car stop and everyone veers over into the bike lane and uh, they may not realize the reason a car stopped is to let someone cross the road. Uh, install signs at the side of each crosswalk indicating stop for pedestrians in crosswalks uh, or the same message with pictographs. Stronger enforcement of the law requiring vehicles to stop for pedestrians in crosswalks. Let me read that one again. Stronger enforcement of law requiring vehicles to stop for pedestrians in crosswalks. The reason I read it twice is that people will be ticketed, they will be summoned, they will be warned for not stopping for pedestrians and crosswalks. And you know, if the, with this message, everyone needs to understand that it may be them, even though certain people wanted this. You know, sometimes the people that want it are the ones that end up getting stopped, not because of any reason other than it just seems to happen that way. Uh, number nine, request the MDOT Commission to review the speed limit in the town center area, and the Chief could give an update on that if you want. And number nine, convene a working group of two town councilors, a school board member, the Chief of Police, and myself to meet four times in 2009 to evaluate how it's all going, to review progress, and to make additional recommendations. So this is a, an, eva an evaluative mechanism to ensure that if we do all these things, how it's working. It will re this would result in quite a bit more signage. Uh, it would result in a little bit of added stoppage down at the high school driveway. The pedestrian light goes in. The cost, these are about estimates, but, but it's proposed to fund the, the high school signal portion as part of the bond issue, and all of the other items would, would be funded from this, this year's sidewalk maintenance account. There's no additional appropriation being asked for. The, the crosswalk would come out of the bond monies that have already been approved. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Chief Williams, would you like to comment on the, the speed issue, the uh, speed limit? Thank you. Um, back in October, I had a uh, occasion to call uh, MDOT because we had a little issue over on 77 by uh, Sperling Church that we wanted to look at. Uh, when I contacted a Kathy D'Souza for MDOT, she uh, suggested that she just check the whole length of 77 all the way to the South Portland line. So, of course, I said, you know, you do what you want to do, but that would be great. Um, November 17th, I contacted Ms. D'Souza, and she alerted me that she has uh, turned all her data over to O'Brien Keyser for MDOT. I contacted uh, um, MDOT today, was not able to get a hold of Mr. Keyser, but I am hopefully uh, awaiting his um, material and his suggestion on uh, what he feels the speed through the center of town should be. Thanks, Chief. But just on that note, the way the process works is the town asks for review. You get an indication of what they think it is. Uh, the, t the town council then formally asks, yay or nay, if you do that, if you want to do that, then it goes to the commissioner, and the commissioner of the Maine Department of Transportation needs to approve any speed limit change. Thank you. 
Uh, question? Um, I have a question. In one of the meetings we were in, it came up that possibly the question whether that area could be designated a school zone. And somebody that, in the meeting I'm said still waiting. I am still awaiting his. Uh, yes. So that can be a question you ask? That is, I am still awaiting his answer on that. Right. Yes. Are we are we suggesting a certain speed? I mean, when we're talking about them reviewing the speed limit, I'm not quite sure. Can we suggest a speed, or do they review the data and then they determine? They review what the, speed the data and they give their suggestions. You, know, you can request a specific one. Okay. But the past experiences, MDOT's engineers, the commissioner listens to them, and it's good to involve their staff before it goes directly to the commissioner or else there's, there's lots of other things that happen that aren't necessarily in our best long-term interest. Yeah, no, I just didn't know sort of who, who said first what speed. So, and I have one other question for, for Mike about the crosswalk. Uh, you said that um, the crosswalk, everything would be done right away except for crosswalks. And um, is that the crosswalk painting or does that also include doing the crosswalk at the high school, the signalized crosswalk? In order for, to have the, 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 the light at the crosswalk, you need the crosswalk painted as well. We'd get it all or whatever, but you can't paint during this temperature. Okay, so, so the signalization, uh, that crosswalk up at the high school wouldn't be done till the spring either, right? Excuse me? So the crosswalk up at the high school? Would be done, yeah, we would get it all ready to go and ready to turn on, but it, uh, but it, wouldn't it has be. to be 50 degrees. 50 okay. and rising, so we don't expect that in the next few months. So not till the spring. Okay, thank you. David? Mike, Mike or Neil, I was wondering if there was a discussion about stronger enforcement of the speed, existing speed limit in the town center area, uh, because certainly the cars that are exceeding the current limit are also posing a hazard to pedestrians. Yes, we, we have been doing that with the traffic car, uh, concentrating on the school zones as well as the town center at this particular time. Yeah. Thanks. Other questions? Thank you, Neil. Thank you. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, David. Um, and this is a question not necessarily for Chief Williams. It could be for either the town manager or the chief. Um, the crosswalk proposed at the high school driveway across 77, um, would that be north or south of the driveway? It would be whatever the traffic engineer recommends. I, I drive through there, and I've been wondering the same thing. Uh, I, I'd want to get a traffic engineer's opinion. And why has that been proposed? I didn't realize that that was an area of problem for people to get across. Because we've seen more and more kids walking to school from Old Ocean House Road area. And biking and, and having difficulty getting across that road. Okay. Other questions? Comments? Is it the pleasure of the council to put a motion on the floor? Ann? I move that we approve the proposed measures to improve pedestrian safety in the town center area as, as listed in the November 24th memo from the manager. I second the motion. Moved by Councillor swift Gadda, seconded by Councillor McKinney. Uh, discussion on the motion. Sarah? I'm just curious when we're going to convene the working group. Item number nine. After the chairman appoints the two councillors, and we ask the school board to appoint their members. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion? Show it to be unanimous, please. Item number 18-2009. Uh, we will look to the town manager again to provide a uh, budget status update, please. I like it over here, Jim. It's near the radiator. <laughs> uh, I want to do a, give a brief budget update, and I've, I've done a PowerPoint on the municipal portion. But before I do that, I want to talk briefly about the school budget. I, I think we're all aware that the governor has proposed a curtailment of $521,000 uh, in, in the school budget for the current year. I've had a number of discussions with Superintendent Alan Hawkins about that, as well as with the council chairman and, and a little bit with the finance uh, committee chairman as well, the, the new finance committee chairman. Uh, 
not Jim with several hats again. <laughs> uh, anyway, the, uh, you know, the schools have a real tough situation to attempt to curtail a budget during the middle of the fiscal year and during the middle of a school year. Uh, 421000 is a lot of money to take when you already have contracts, the position set up, the system set up. The, a lot of their supplies and all those things are bought at the beginning of the current year. They've been looking at the curtailment. They've been looking at the curtailment issue. They have a $70,000 contingency fund, which they're discussing tapping. Uh, they have some roof work that uh, they're, they're putting off. They've put a, a very hard, what I would call a hard freeze, on purchase of supplies and uh, uh, teacher professional development and a bunch of other things. You know, even with all those measures, it, it's, it's really difficult to, to adjust their budget during the year. Uh, knowing that, and, and even before I knew the amount, I had some discussions with the council chairman, and uh, we had discussion that the town has an undesignated surplus. The undesignated surplus is for cash flow, uh, because taxes come in twice a year, we don't have money all at the same time. It's something that our bond rating agencies look at to have a, a certain percentage. And it, it, it's also, uh, you know, available for, uh, you know, if things uh, come along unexpectedly, if there was a disaster, if there was something like this. So, you know, knowing all those factors, I've, I've recommended, and Jim, Jim uh, was in consensus, that we ought to transfer $200,000 from the town's designate, undesignated fund balance to the school undesignated fund balance. Th this amount would not increase the school budget at all. What it would do is be part of their overall plan of addressing how they're going to deal with 421000 The suggestion on the agenda is that there be some meetings of the, the finance chairs and the, the chairs of the council and school board before your January meeting and uh, discuss, you know, what's being done to address the curtailment, look at the long range picture, some of those issues. And then at your January 6th meeting, you would have a finance committee meeting, a committee of the whole council, and you'd make a recommendation to the town council on that proposal or any other alternative proposal. And that would come to your, your meeting on the second Monday of January. So that's the, the school budget portion of this. I also want to go over of where we stand with the municipal budget. Uh, thus far, looking at all of the municipal revenues for the year, we're still projecting through June 30 that we're going to, we're going to achieve our revenues. In, in not all of them, but in, in the netting out, we're going to achieve our revenues. So it looks like the municipal budget is in uh, you know, relatively good shape, particularly since, as the slide shows, the, the recession ahead. I didn't find one that's a danger recession. But uh, you know, now that we're officially in a recession, recession, we're officially in a recession. But the, our outlook for 2010 is not great. Uh, and, uh, and I'm calling you know 2010 as far as our budget a new decade with old challenges. You know, we, we, we always have challenges with revenues. We Cape Elizabeth is what it is. We're primarily a residential community. There's not you know there hasn't been a whole lot of desire to do fees in a lot of different ways. But I think what's really significant is between the turn of the, the beginning of the decade when about 52% of the budget was funded by the property tax municipal budget, now it's over 60%. You know, that's a, a pretty significant, it's a 15% shift um, in terms of, in terms of you know, real percentages of the budget pie from non-property tax uh, sources to property tax. So it's you know, one reason why there's concern about the property tax and issue. So what's the outlook for, for the next fiscal year? It shows that non-property tax revenues are going to fall $361,000. That's about 10% of the, the revenues from sources other than the property tax. That, that's, a, that's a significant challenge, obviously. Uh, what's that caused? Uh, if you look at excise tax, uh, the amount that's proposed in the fiscal year uh, 2010 budget is the same amount that was achieved in fiscal year 2001. Basically, nine years, we're going back to the level of nine years ago. Uh, that it's about 300,000 less than we had in our peak year. It's, as you can see, less than our actual 2008. But the most significant thing 
it's, it's about 170,000 less than the current year budget. And it's, it, the pictures at the bottom, we're getting a lot more older cars, people coming and registering. There's a lower tax rate. Even the older cars that are being registered are older than they were a year ago, two years ago. It, obviously, older cars get older. But, but in, in general volumes, the older cars are getting older. Uh, we also I, I, I drive a trailblazer. We have a trailblazer here. There aren't too many people buying uh, trailblazers, new ones these days. And uh, so as a result, we're getting doubly hit on, on excise tax. State revenue sharing, uh, we're all reading about you know, the fact there's a school budget curtailment. State revenue sharing, it comes from a percentage of the sales tax and income taxes. We're down 100,000 from the peak. We're, we're down at the same level of state revenue sharing as we were a full 10 years ago. Uh, and it's, that's another loss of 58,000 that adds up to the total 361,000 loss. We also have some budget increase pressures. The, there was an attempt during last year's budget to privatize the fitness center and eventually that fell through. The person backed out. The, 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 the monies it just wouldn't work so someone could do it profitably. As a result, it reopened. It cost 68000 gross to, to staff that. That's money that's not budgeted. If the fitness centers continue, it creates a hole at the very beginning of the budget process on the expenditure side of 68000 uh, the contracts with our collective bargaining units at $65,308. Uh, now that we know what they are, and that includes uh, the wage adjustments as well as re retirement uh, issues, Social Security, the rest of it. Health insurance and workers' comp, that we uh, had a 7.7% .7 increase in health insurance. And our, our, as I mentioned previously, our experience modification is, is up in, in the workers' comp area primarily because of... Uh, two claims that the school department is, has been aggressively working at trying to, uh, trying to resolve, but it, we're in the same workers' comp fund pool, so uh, we, we both get hit by it. That's 40,000 of that's health insurance, 43, 20,000 20, workers' comp. Hydro rentals up. So there's 200,000 in uh, what, what I'd call obligations. So what this adds up to, it, if you add up those two, two things, it's 561,000. But then we do get revenue from you know, the new houses you see being built. And uh, the town's portion of that's 43,000. The school's portion of it will be about 100, 100 a little over 100,000. But on the municipal, this is municipal only, not school. It's a $517,000 budget challenge that we're facing as we look toward uh, the, 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 the budget calendar. So what are, what are my goals during the process? Uh, first is, is, is to have a budget that's not blue smoke, blue smoke in bearers. And to achieve savings, you know, not that, you know, I hope we have a light winter. I hope this happens. I hope that happens. It's to have a budget with clearly definable, achievable budget savings. Uh, you know, re real numbers. And really define the numbers, you know, get it so everyone understands exactly what we're talking about, what the numbers are. Secondly, is to prepare a budget with no tax increase on the municipal side and with no new fee areas. You know, don't don't just put in new fees to make up additional revenue, but there still could be adjustment of fees likely were appropriate. But the plan is, is, uh, is you know, that I would prepare the municipal budget to prepare a budget with no tax fees. So what you'll get is a list of all sorts of proposed adjustments. And if you want to put something, you know, fund one of those things, that's a list of a proposed adjustment. You have a choice of adding revenue from a fee or from property tax or finding some other area to cut instead of doing that. Uh, but, you know, what, what I'm committing to doing is providing you a list in a, recommend, in a recommended budget, not one I'm going to waffle on and say, you know, I don't really support, but because, you know, we, I, know what, I know what's before us. I know it, it's uh, not a good year. I've said to the press that it's not a whole big appetite for tax increases. And I appreciate that. So you'll get a budget that, that does a lot of what I would hope to be the heavy lifting, although you will still have to make really difficult decisions. Ultimately, it's up to the council that determines the priorities. But, but I'm already working with department heads, identifying different areas, and you know, working towards a goal of, of over $500,000 in uh, recommended savings. Part of that will include what we're talking about, significant structural changes, totally looking differently at how we're providing services, who's providing them, whether or not, you know, they're, they're a service we're going to provide. There's a lot of meaning in, as the department heads are learning, 
in the term significant structural changes. Uh, but, uh, you know, every th I hate, I'm trying to avoid all the cliches, uh, but every, everything is on the table. Uh, there's, there's nothing that's not. Uh, you can't find this amount of money in a budget the size of the municipal budget without having everything on the table and, and structurally doing things differently or not doing them at all. And that goes into the next bullet is the next goal is to do what we do well. What it's, what's decided, you know, I, I don't want to nickel and dime in my budget recommendation to you the different services that we're going to continue to provide or that we, we do provide. Either I think we ought, either ought to provide a service and do it well or not provide the service. There's, there's, there's uh, you know, there's, there's different optional areas where maybe we don't have to provide the service, but I, if we're going to do something, let's, let's not do it in a half-baked way. Uh, what I'd like to do is by January 6th actually give you the list of the $500,000 that I'm looking at. So there'll, there'll be plenty of time for public comment on it. By that point, it will have been individually communicated to all the employees who it most directly affects, uh, as well as the department heads you know, will have worked with me uh, on the different numbers, massage the numbers, you can see, you can see they all left, but anyway, uh, they, they've been great so far at uh, discussing the different issues and, uh, you know, they, they know that it's not going to be easy before them. And the, the final bullet on this one is I also, you know, once that gets out in early January, once you, you begin to process public opinion on it, some of this, I don't, I'd like you not to wait until the budget vote in May or whatever it is to, to make some of the decisions on some of these issues. Because there's implementation time, there's, depending on, you know, if, if there's uh, significant structural changes that result in a different personnel picture, uh, you know, th there could be some transition costs involved in that, and some of the transition costs we might want to handle early. Secondly, there are, there are issues that, you know, once you announce them, might cause certain things to happen that make the decisions, make the, those things difficult to continue to, to do in the longer term. Uh, so, in, you know, while the, the overall budget will be coming later, you know, there's this broad outline of, of, you know, really what makes up the big picture of the budget. I think it's, it's you know, th these revenues are not going to suddenly skyrocket. You know, we have a, we have a new president coming. We, ex we all expect miracles from the new president. but you know, he's, he's, he's a limited human being like we all are, and uh, he doesn't do it alone. So, uh, you know, I, I want to encourage uh, some early decisions, some thought, and some direction. Uh, and, and this is something I found on the internet. I, was, I, I tried to look for a picture that, uh, when I Googled optimism, and th this uh, came up, you can't always get what you want, but you can get what you need. And, and, and I think this is, this is a good message for the, for the budget process this year. Uh, you can't always get what you want, but I think it's really identifying what the citizens truly need, what they need as, as a group from government, and what they otherwise can't pay, pay for. So, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be challenging, it's going to be difficult, but I think, you know, everyone realizes the seriousness of, of the situation now. And, you know, and the municipal government, I think, has some opportunities to look at what it's doing. And, you know, I'm not going to, you know, I've been, been encouraging the department heads. It was deathly silent uh, when we talked about these things at the meeting today. But, you know, we, we have responsibilities to the citizens to put up the best face on things and to, uh, to move ahead positively. And, you know, as, as challenging and as difficult as will be, particularly for some people uh, who are, who are going to be directly affected by it, it's, uh, it's what we need to do in order to, to prepare for the next decade and figure out what our priorities are. So I look forward with the finance chairman, with the council chairman, with all of you, and with the citizens and the, all the others, the departments involved in the budget process to uh, address these issues that are before us and to, uh, to move on to 2009 with, uh, with you know, a lot of concern, but also with, with faith that people working together will make some good decisions and advance the community forward. So thank you. Thank you, Mike. There's some comment, uh, Ann. Um, I want to thank Mike for that outline. I, I think he's right. We have a big challenge ahead of us, but I have no doubt that we will all do our best to meet that challenge. I did want to make 
the, the council aware of two other factors which Mike didn't mention in his presentation, but I know he's very well aware of. And I also want to mention these for the sake of the citizens who might be watching. There are two other factors that I'm concerned about. Um, there's probably not only two, but there's two that come to mind at the moment. Um, one is, the first is the budget impact on the, the upcoming budget, the fiscal, oh, ten, the fiscal 10 budget of what could be a declining percentage of our property tax collections. Right now, as those of you who uh, were met with the auditors last time, David wasn't there, but everybody else was, we have um, a very high collection rate. It's 99.5% or I can't remember exactly what the percentage is, but we collect a really high percentage of our property taxes in Cape Elizabeth, much higher than most towns in Maine do. Given that a recession is coming and that residents will be feeling the pinch if they are having problems with their own jobs or their own finances, just be aware that if our uh, property tax collection rate goes from 99.5% to 97.5%, which would still be an excellent rate, that could be about a half million dollars, $460,000 that we wouldn't be collecting, that we would think we should be collecting, but we might not be collecting. So that's something to think about. I'm not saying it will happen, but keep that in mind, because that's what, that is one thing uh, that uh, undesignated fund balances are, are used for, uh, to, to prop that up. The second factor is that I was doing some reading today because I have a meeting in Augusta on Wednesday uh, up at Maine Municipal, and um, we're meeting with our legislative policy committee and looking at three, uh, at whether we should take positions um, in front of the, as an organization, MMA as an organization, on three uh, citizen referenda that will be going before the legislature, but in my judgment and in most people's judgment at MMA will probably be on the state ballot this coming November, November 09. One of those is uh, a proposal to change excise tax, um, the, the system of, of how much is collected. And if that, it's, it's very appealing to um, the average citizen because basically it sort of chops in half the rate that you would pay for, for your excise tax when you're registering a car. Um, and so I don't think the legislature will just pass it. I think they'll send it to the people. But I think there's a, a semi-decent chance it could get passed. And if it does, that would cut for the state, uh, for municipalities, 40% of our excise tax revenue. And that's a big source of revenue for us. So that's something else just to sort of file away in the back of your mind. I'm not trying to be gloom and doom here. but. It, the council should be aware, and I think the citizens should be aware that these uh, two factors are looming out there that um, are just things to take into account when we're thinking about the budgets and, and decisions we'll be making in the coming months. So. Can I have one thing? Just in, in response to Ann's first point, I won't address the second one. We can discuss that at other meetings. But uh, I worked with uh, Deborah Lane today to really study uh, the taxes that were due in October and to look to see what the collection rate is. And we were pleased that we were already at 97% of that tax commitment. Of, of the amount that was due that day was uh, a little over 11 million? Yes. How much? A little over 11 million. All but 315,000 of that has been paid. Of the 315,000, three of those were, no, 25% of that was in three properties. Uh, two, two uh, residential properties and the, the old Haven Healthcare Viking Nursing Home property was the, the largest one. But to, you know, our thought was that's pretty close to what it probably is most years at this point in time. So right. we're, we're pleasantly surprised that that is not yet creeping up as an issue. But, and, but, and but, I, I, but your point's well taken. I, yeah, I am pleasantly it, we're, surprised we're pleasant to hear that point. too, but I think that next uh, April's collections and next October's collections may not be quite as cheery. I hope they're just as good, but realistically speaking, given the recession we're in, I'm not sure they will be. Dave? Uh, Mike, I'm just wondering what the impact of the budget, the school budget that the voters approved last July, 
uh, has in all of this in that does the town have the discretion or authority to deviate from the budget that the voters approved? I have no idea um, what the answer to that question is, but I, I'm wondering if we could explore that before we meet to discuss this next. We, we, we haven't explored that directly, and that's you know, one reason why I emphasized is that we were transferring money from undesignated surplus account to, to undesignated surplus account. It's not at all changing the school budget. The school budget is, is remaining the same. Well, I guess maybe it's an issue of semantics, but if the school budget remains the same, I'm not sure that matters if we're not funding it. Uh, so I, I just think we need to explore that issue. Uh, I mean, does the town have an obligation to fund the budget at the budget level that was approved by the voters last July? Uh, I, I think, you know, that's a good question, and we can do some more research on it, looking at exactly what the vote was last July. Uh, the ta if I could partially answer, the tax rate has already been set, you know, it was set last August based on a certain set of financial assumptions, and one, one was the amount of revenue that would come from the state. So whatever was left over was the amount that property taxes was going to fund. So now since the state has cut their revenues, they're coming up short on the revenue side, but the, the property tax amount that's being collected is set at this point. I suppose that we could go back and I, I've never heard of a town doing this unless perhaps a mill closed or something like that. We could go back and raise taxes again with some sort of second, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, assessment or something. But, but that's the only way I know of to increase property taxes. So, I mean, and then the other thing is the school budget is set like the town budget is set, but you, the budgeted amount is set but you can always choose not to spend up to your budgeted amount. Again, I don't know the answer. Uh, it's just that we went through this long, arduous process to approve a budget, and I, I think the expectation was that it would be funded. Uh, and it, it, at the very least, uh, we have the po possibility of the undesignated funds being transferred. But again, I just don't know the answer to the question. Can I ask a question? Uh, sir. Has the state, have, have the representatives, elected representatives actually voted on this cut or, or, or decision? They haven't, right? Not uh, yet. Yeah. So that's just worth throwing out there to the citizens that we do have elected representatives and we do get to talk to them. And so if you're discontent with the, the plan that they're proceeding with, drop them an email would be my suggestion. I don't think it's cast in stone. I think that was her initial suggestion. So. Yeah, we, with uh, Chairman Jim's uh, encouragement, uh, we are in the process of inviting the legislators who represent Cape Elizabeth to your workshop uh, on January 6th, I believe the date is. We, <laughs> so far, I've got a call into Senator Bliss. It's going to start with him and, and then work with the, the two uh, state representatives. But. The, if they're available, we would hope to have them there that evening, too, so you can communicate to them whatever message you'd like. Has the date been set for their vote? Do you know? No, no. They they went in session Wednesday, and now they're on recess until January seventh. So. <laughs> okay. That's just the way this gets. You know, they've got committees to appoint. It takes a while to organize the legislature. Thank you for the update. Uh, the comments, David. Um, I'd like to thank the town manager for his presentation. Uh, we all know that the year ahead is going to be a very challenging year. Um, what none of us know is how challenging it's really going to be, not only on a local level, but a state level and on a national level, and I guess on a world level for that matter. Uh, we just don't know uh, where this is headed. And I think that the town manager is showing real management leadership in stepping forward and committing to present us with the option of a zero tax increase budget, recognizing that it will require some very hard decisions, but decisions that need to be made nonetheless. Some of them will be unpopular. Um, I want to acknowledge that and want to thank him for being willing to 
step forward, take the first whack with the, with the hatchet. Um, and I think he could say to the council, you work it out in your own budget decisions, but that's not what we're hearing from him. And I respect the leadership that he's showing in being willing to present us with his first, uh, first take on what a zero tax budget can look like. Well said, David. Yeah, I'd like to uh, second David's comments. I absolutely agree with him 100 percent. Other comments? Mike, thank you very much for your work on this. Uh, we, we truly do appreciate it. Jim, I'm sorry. Sorry. I just wanted to, there, Michael had, uh, the manager had recommended that the town council take the following actions, and I didn't know if we needed to vote on those. Uh, I don't think we were calling for a vote, were we, tonight? Would you, well, we just? Mm, I was trying to encourage it. Around. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, then, could I make a motion? You can. I'd like to uh, move that the council take the following actions. First, that we request the town manager to keep us, the council, updated on the impact of the economy on local revenues and expenditures. Second, uh, that the council uh, request the council chair and the finance committee chair to meet with their, it says finance committee, but I think it means the finance committee chair to meet with our counterparts on the school board to review the status of the state general purpose aid proposed curtailment and to discuss how the town may cooperatively assist the school department should the proposed curtailment be implemented. And we have a tentative date, I believe, for the 19th, don't we, Mike? Between leadership? De December 19th, yes. Yes. Um, and then third, uh, I'd like to move that we uh, schedule or put on the January 12th town council, 2009 town council agenda uh, a recommendation from the finance committee related to the proposed two, uh, 2009, fiscal year 09, GPA curtailment. And then lastly, I'd like to add one thing, which is to um, have a public forum after our January 6th workshop where the manager is going to be presenting his, his proposals, um, his recommendations. Have a public forum um, after that point for the public to comment on their priorities and their suggestions to address the fiscal 10 budget challenges. In other words, we'll, have, we'll hear from the manager, and I've discussed this with the manager, so he's okay with this idea, um, to uh, hear from the public what their priorities are for programs and everything else after that. So I'd, that's the motion. That's my motion. Could you please repeat the motion? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. Second. <laughs> Thank you. Moved and seconded. Uh, discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? 6-0. Thank you, Ian. Um, item number 19-2009, uh, recommendation from the Recycling Working Group. And I spoke with uh, Councilor Swift-Kayata before the meeting, and she has agreed to, uh, to bring that item for, before us. Sure. Um, a number of us met, including Councillor Lennon um, and also Michael, Bob Malley, um, who else was there? Rachel Stamieshkin, who was, is, or, yes, is a member of the Recycling Committee, and is there Jennifer Impott. Oh, Jennifer, yes, her, her replacement on this little subcommittee. Anyways, we met several times, and uh, we, there's a memo from us uh, in your packet. I won't go through everything on the memo, but basically we noted that recycling rates have improved in Cape Elizabeth, but have not improved to the level that we would like to see them improve. It's a, a, has a huge, recycling has a huge budget impact uh, as well as being good for the environment, but it has a huge budget impact on the municipal budget. The cost of not recycling, um, is enormous. Every ton that you recycle instead of throwing into trash in the hopper uh, saves you $142. Um, and that works out to thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. We considered all sorts of alternatives. That's why we met three or four times. We looked at curbside pickup. We looked at pay per bag. We looked at pay per throw at the dump. 
uh, excuse me, the recycling center. Um, <laughs> and um, we came up with a variety of um, options. We tried to attach cost savings or, or increases to each one of them. I won't go through them all, but we found that curbside pickup added a net cost of $450,000. That paper bag saved a net cost of about $19,000. Um, that recycling education, which was a third alternative, which uh, meant supplementing the current personnel coverage at the recycling center to provide a person there at all time to sort of monitor what's going into the hopper and to gently redirect people who were throwing things that were recyclable things into the hopper to say, there's a place over there, you can put that where it could be recycled. Um, and also combining that with continuing education on the website and through signage. And we thought that alternative could increase the recycling rate. The net savings of that was about 18,000. We also talked about hours at the recycling center and um, reducing the hours to save money. We want to note that because, the way eco, because of the way EcoMain uh, de determines its uh, assessments, it's based on a rolling five-year average of their tonnage. So you don't get any changes you make. You won't see the full impact on our rate um, at EcoMain for five years. But that's a very quick run-through of what we did. Our recommendations are an enhanced, this was the consensus of the group, an enhanced program of recycling education that will generate long-term savings of 18,000 per year at, at present values. A change in the recycling center hours that would generate $14,000 annually in net savings at present values. The new hours would be Monday, 10 a.m. to 7 p.m., Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday closed. So that's a net change of uh, 10 hours, Michael? It's the Thursday hours plus two hours on Wednesday. Um, we are also proposing that amendments be made to the solid waste ordinance that will require recycling. Right now, there's no teeth in anything, even if you have somebody at the recycling center saying you should recycle that. Somebody could just say why. And now, if we had some changes to the ordinance, we could say because it's the ordinance, it's the law. Um, we also talked, we also had recommendations on the uh, use of the recycling center by commercial haulers who use non-mechanized equipment. And after some discussion, we uh, concluded that suspending this service would be a burden to the customers in town, a, num a number of senior citizens who have their trash taken to the recycling center by these non-mechanized small business people. Mm -hmm. um, so the recommendation is that the staff monitor those haulers to ensure that all the waste being brought to the recycling center is really waste from Cape Elizabeth. And it's in their interests to do this right because otherwise they could face more draconian measures in the future. So um, those are our recommendations. And um, we are recommending, so I'd like to make a motion that this item be included on the January 6th Council Workshop Agenda, that the proposed ordinance amendment be referred to the Ordinance Committee, and that the proposed change in hours at the Recycling Center be the subject of a public hearing at the January 12th Town Council meeting. Second motion. Moved and seconded. Uh, discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Six zero. Thank you, Andy. Thank you and the committee for your work on that. Uh, Going to move us forward faster than we were. Item uh, 20-209, 2009, uh, Tiger Lily Lane. Um, this may look familiar to you. Uh, you may think that we visited this issue before. We did in part um, at the time, which was in July. Uh, the developer of Cross Hill uh, did not have a, uh, frankly, did not have a clear understanding of the menu of things that could have happened when Tiger Lily was brought uh, to our uh, agenda. Uh, consequently, he did not anticipate that the council would uh, table the item 
uh, as it did. And consequently to that, he, he was not in attendance at that meeting. Uh, he has since uh, contacted me, and uh, I have agreed to, uh, to sponsor his appearance uh, on the agenda tonight. Uh, simply in the interest of fairness, uh, he requested a, the, the uh, opportunity to speak to our council, and I think he deserves that right. So uh, that's why the issue uh, appears on our agenda again this evening. So I would ask uh, Steve Parkhurst from Cross Hill LLC to, uh, to come to the lectern, please. Uh, Does this require a motion to remove it from the table, or because it's, since it's a new council year, is that new, not necessary? Council year or new council year? New council year. I think we're okay. My name is Steve Parker. I live at 21 Oakhurst Road. Um, I don't know if you folks have reread the packet that was delivered for the mix-up meeting that I didn't come to um, because I was told I didn't need to. Um, if you have Great. If you haven't, I'd be happy to read the cover letter again. All set. We've read. Everybody all set. Okay. Um, I, I'll make this very simple. Um, I have two lots across Hill, lots number 81 and 82, excuse me, 82 and 83, that <clears throat> if a roadway goes in between those two lots, those lots are going to end up with about a 15-foot cliff in their backyard. And I've had plenty of people who have been interested in the lots, but they want to know one way or another if this roadway is going to go in. And I can't imagine a family with small children would want to buy one, one of those lots because it's an absolute kid killer. Um, so I'm just here to ask that um, the town release its rights in that one section of the road that I donated to the town. Uh, the further benefit will be, obviously, someone will then build houses on those two lots. If you check out the assessments in, on Tiger, Lily, and Pepperbush, uh, the tax revenue from those two lots, just on the houses alone, not including the land, should be about somewhere between eleven and $14,000 a piece. And <clears throat> it'll be a very nice place for someone to live. And I'm just hoping that's going to happen because otherwise they, they're unsaleable. And just for a little information for the, for the council, uh, the Cross Hill neighborhood is currently generating $683,753.20 in tax revenue. And <clears throat> I have seven lots left. Two, these are two of them. They will get built, uh, hopefully, and there will be additional tax revenue in a time that obviously we need it. Any questions? Sir? Can you explain why creating the road would make a large cliff? Excuse me? You said if they create a road, it would make a big cliff or drop off? Why, why is that? Did you see the picture of the, with me standing in front of the ledge? I'm sure it was in. First packet. First packet. The picture was clearer than uh, when we took it up in July. Just quick. The roadway, <clears throat> I'm probably, if you're facing, looking at the road, I am about a third away from the right hand boundary. And in order to get water utilities in there, the water has to be at least five and a half to six feet deep under the ground roadway. So they'd have to blast approximately 20 to 21 and a half feet of lead in order to get the water in. And <clears throat> if they built the roadway back up at the same level that it's at at the cul-de-sac, it would result in a 15 foot to 16 foot cliff. And it can't be tapered. I mean, that's just too much of a um, too much of a drop to taper. You'd have to blow both lots um, with dynamite to try to make them level. Thank you. Any other questions? Other questions of uh, Mr. Parker? Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Uh, 
We have also had a request from the abutter, uh, the owner of the abutting property uh, would like to speak to this issue as well. I'm Penny Jordan, the spokesperson for the Jordan family. Um, I can't necessarily, um, at this point in time, uh, I guess argue whether a cliff would be created or not, because if um, that right of way was ever accessed for any reason for our back property, we, I assume could potentially come in with utilities from um, another direction, but I can't 100% answer that for sure. I would assume that a planful approach would be taken to any uh, work that would be done in that back property. Um, I also can't say that the uh, property of the Jordan family can even hit that tax rate of a uh, $11,000 to $14,000. But what I can say is that um, something that I mentioned in the email that I sent to all of you that uh, our family is continually committed to balancing the needs of our property with the needs of the town. And um, my father, Bill Jordan, he continually took that comprehensive view of our property. And in the communication uh, Mr. Parkhurst presented to the council, he mentioned uh, Deer Run Road and um, Hockey Pond Lane, which are on the totally opposite side of the property in which we're talking. And as you look at, if anything were ever to be done with that property, we need an entrance and an exit. Deer Run Road and Hockey Pond Lane are in the same place. And so Tiger Lily Lane has been an integral part of our comprehensive plan for our property at Jordan's Farm. What we want to do is we would like to ensure that any um, descendants of Bill Jordan have an opportunity to um, access and utilize that land in any way that they deem necessary at that point in time. At this point, we uh, have no desire to develop that property. I have no idea what's going to happen 20 years from now, and neither does anybody else. And that's why we encourage that the council uh, maintain, consider maintaining that right of way, because we never know what barriers we could create if we shut off that right of way at this point in time. And so the Jordan family, uh, we oppose the discontinuance of that right of way because it landlocks 70 acres of our property. Are there any questions? Questions, comments? Uh, I would ask now what the pleasure of the council is at this point. Uh, do we want to formally reconsider uh, the vote taken last year? Uh, Any comment? David? I, I think as a matter of procedure, mm -hmm. you're asking for a motion okay. to reconsider. Motion to reconsider, that, I guess. That I don't know whether um, whether it's a motion to reconsider that's that's appropriate as much as. It's, it's a new action, so whatever. Any, yeah, any whatever motion that somebody wants okay. to make. We would need a new motion then. David? Well, you can tell me if this motion is proper or not, but I would move that we not deviate from the prior decision of the town council that we uh, maintain the town's right of way uh, over Tiger Lily Lane, traversing this part of the Cross Hill development into the Jordan property. That motion's in order. I have a second? Second. May I make a proposal? Procedurally, that the instead of the motion being made, sort of in the negative, not to do something, that there be a motion made to, to approve the relinqu or relinquishment of the town's rights as requested by Mr. Parkhurst. I'm not seeking to approve the relinquishment of the town's rights. I, I, I understand, okay. and you don't have to support it to make the motion. But the problem with making a motion in the negative, if it's denied. If we don't support it, then it leaves open. 
what the effect is of the vote. Mm. Okay. So would, you make a motion. Would the, the motion order. in the positive be then to maintain the town's easement? Could be. Sure. Uh, be willing to re make it that way. Re that. Re the that. Re motion to maintain the town's easement as it now stands. As it now stands. Or as it now exists. That's the motion. Do we have a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion on the motion. Salt so, through the chairman. Um, Michael, do you have anything to add to this discussion? Uh, not really. I, I, I had recommended back in July that you go through the process whenever we get a request like this. Uh, that we we review it by the Conservation Commission because it has uh, it always has implications for trails that sort of thing, and that it, it go to the water district because of there's there's implications for the water supply system and municipal departments because there's there's always issues involving fire access some of those issues. Uh, you know the discussion last July was you know why do that if we're not going to approve it anyway, uh, and you know I think all of those things still hold in July if if even if we went to those groups and for whatever reason they said release it if you didn't feel that'd be persuasive then you know you probably ought not to have all those groups go through all that process there's been a lot of discussion over the years of the council asking people to do things spinning wheels as opposed to realistic uh, expectations so to answer your question uh, you know it, it's really a policy decision of the council the staff traditionally has favored Connect connectivity uh, that's a little bit problematic with the citizen vote of uh, a year or so ago uh, because the staff still believes connectivity is the way to go uh, you know so you know really it's a it's a policy issue for the council the we don't have a specific recommendation but a general principles connectivity is good and that you should only have ask uh, other bodies and municipal departments to do things if there's a realistic ex uh, expectation uh, that uh, the time would be worthwhile spent doing. Okay. Thank you. I will, uh, oh, go ahead, David. Well, to the extent that we're in discussion mm -hmm. on the motion, um, although I'm sympathetic to Mr. Parkhurst's position, um, and certainly understand the desire to want to want to sell the additional two lots. Um, I think it's important that the town retain flexibility uh, for the possible development and use of that road sometime in the future. Um, that would be short-sighted for us to relinquish those rights today. Thank you, David. Uh, I'll be supporting the motion as well, and the reason is. Uh, if the abutting property owners had been on board with this, uh, I would absolutely see no problem in doing it. But uh, this is a situation, I think, where you really need all the parties in, in concert. Otherwise, I think we're, we're, we're creating a problem more than solving one. So uh, I will be supporting the motion as well. Other comments? Seeing none, uh, all in favor of the motion to retain the uh, the town's right of way at the end of Tiger Lily Lane. Show it to be unanimous. Item number 21-2009, uh, the approval of the town council goals for 2009. A motion from Councillor Swift Kayada to accept the, uh, the town council goals for 2009 as proposed and as are listed in our packets. Second. Second by Councillor Lennon. Mr. Chair, um, I'm not sure if this is a, a typo. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, in 1C, it, it, I think it should say working with the Cape Elizabeth School Board, comma, set financial targets. It, it, it once said working, it was edited through one of the edits back to work. <laughs> <laughs> then perhaps it should say work with the Cape Elizabeth School Board to set financial targets. One or the other. Exactly. One or the other. I'm okay, okay with either one. Okay. We had a motion and a second. Uh, and we're we'll okay add, with either of the. We'll add the word to. Okay, we'll add the word to. Uh, other, 
Other comments, questions, discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Item number 22-2009, the, the Nordic Ski Trail Phase 2. Uh, we have a representative uh, from the Nordic Ski Group with us tonight, Leslie Barton, and uh, I believe he has a presentation to make. Thank you. Just put, up, put this up real quick. I hope you all can see this. You know what, Lizzie, if you put it down. That's fine. Okay. Um, thank you very much for um, letting me uh, address you briefly. Um, I wanted to just take a, just a very brief minute to um, just do a quick update on where we are with the Gulf Crest Trail. Um, and again, emphasize that although I am um, a past president of Cape Nordic and a representative of the Nordic com community, I want it to be understood that this is, again, a multi-use trail and, and very much we've had great support um, from various other groups other than the Nordic group, and um, that hopefully will continue to be the case. Um, I also wanted to um, just say that um, there's a great support that we've had through the town and cooperation with the town with Bob Malley and, and Mike and, and other members of the town in supporting our group. and had a, a synergy of, of work, work, working together with the town in um, being able to accomplish many of the things that we've been able to do with the Gold Crest Trail. And again, um, just wanted to thank you for that. Um, as many of you know, um, the trail was initially completed in the winter of 2006-2007, so we've now enjoyed um, two years of, of use, two and a half years of use of the trail. and. Um, I've been blamed for two relatively heavy snow winters the last two years, and, and I don't know if that will, trend will continue, but um, we certainly have enjoyed um, being able to utilize that trail for skiing. But again, I want to emphasize that the trail has also been utilized by walkers, hikers, mountain bikers, dog walkers, um, cross-country runners, and many other members of our community. So it's been a great multi-use um, facility for everyone. Um, what we're seeking at this point is to get your approval to begin an initial phase of phase two. Um, as many of you remember, when the trail was first designed, we hired John Morton, who was a, kind of the foremost uh, Nordic trail designer. Um, and when the initial design was put together, um, we made it an all-encompassing trail around the transfer station area. I think, I and mean, I apologize, this isn't a very big map, but um, I think you can see this is the marsh. Um, this is the public works uh, buildings. This is the transfer station area. Um, so initial, the initial phase was completed in um, the winter of 06-07, which is a um, 2.68 kilometer loop, which is, in, which is called phase one, which is this yellow outlined trail, and many of you are familiar with that. In fact, I, I apologize for not having a PowerPoint presentation, but I thought if you'd like, I'll just pass. Um, I do have some photographs of the trail. Many of you have had a chance to walk it, but I'll, if you'd like, I, I can pass those if you'd like to look at that. So um, phase one was completed several years ago. We've enjoyed two and a half years of use there. What we're asking at this point is to do an initial portion of what is phase two. And phase two initially was an additional um, about four kilometers of trail, which goes back to the other side of the Gulf Crest Fields area. Um, so phase two was this four kilometer loop that went all the way over to this area. Um, what we've found at at this point was that realistically, with budget constraints and constraints in, in raising the funds to do the additional all of phase two, which is four kilometers, we are asking for approval to do uh, one and a quarter kilometer portion of phase two, which we're calling phase 2A. And um, that is the area that is highlighted kind of in this purplish maroon section. 
So it's a continuance, it, it connects with phase one. It actually, if you're familiar with this area, it actually about a half a kilometer of this is, actually it's about um, six tenths of a kilometer of this is part of an existing road which is sometimes affectionately called um, Deer Kill, uh, Road Kill Road, which is the section that is already an open road where the town comes down with their vehicle. So this area is actually already a completed road. It's about six tenths of a kilometer. So what we would need to clear with, with approval would be this additional portion of phase 2A, um, this portion of which is mostly upland deciduous forest, fairly open and fairly easily cleared. This section actually abuts a wetlands area. The um, green here is a, is a wetlands area. And actually, I did want to point out the initial design of phase two crossed the wetlands here. And in working in concert with the OST Associates and Steve Harding, um, it has been recommended by him that we, in fact, um, change our phase to, to circumvent and not cross that wetlands area, but in fact skirt up onto highland, higher area and go in this direction. So that is a little bit of a change from the initial design of phase two. And then go back over again a, a dry area and then loop back. So what we're proposing and asking for is approval to do this one and a quarter kilometer section. Um, the thought would be that with, with approval, um, now that we're into the winter season, we probably would not get into clearing that initially, but with approval next spring, with work party uh, groups as we did with phase one, we would do uh, the clearing of that area. Um, we would do a fundraising campaign to raise money for the excavation process, which is the part that we need to raise money for, and the hope is that next spring and into next summer and, and by next fall have this additional portion completed. The long-term plan, you know, going into the future would be that at some point we'd like to maybe bite off another portion of phase two, but at this point, realistically, we feel that it would be best to break it into sections. Nice. Any questions? Very nice. Thank you, Mr. Barton. Yeah. Uh, questions, comments? Thank you for, for your presentation, Muzzy. Thank you. Um, we have uh, a recommendation uh, on this item, and, and would somebody like to uh, put a motion to the floor? Paul? I'd like to make a motion that we approve and authorize the uh, permits to be obtained for Phase 2A as briefed, provide provided all funds for the permitting shall be pri privately funded and that no work occur on site until the town council approve all permit conditions. Second. Moved by Councilor McKinney, seconded by Councilor swift Kayata. Uh, discussion on the motion? I just, say something brief. I just thanks Jim. I, I want to thank Muzzy and all of the volunteers for, for the work on this. For show Again, they had the vision of the first phase, which brings about the second phase. But I also, in addition to them, I also wanted to particularly thank OST Associates. Uh, they were contracted to do this work with some monies that have been donated. And like a few things, they do much more than the authorized number of hours. A lot of this has been pro bono as well. So I, I want to thank Steve Harding and Harvey Oost and OST Associates as well for uh, a lot of extra work well beyond the contract they've done uh, on this. Thank you. Thank you for filling us in on that. Uh, other comments, uh, discussion on the motion, David? I just want to echo what a great uh, thing you've done for our town, and I encourage people in our town who've used it, or even if you haven't, to go uh, to uh, seriously consider a donation when you're out, I'm sure, fundraising in the months to come, because it's been a great thing for our town. Jim, I, w I was just going to say, uh, just um, to echo Mike's comments earlier, this is another great example of a public-private uh, relationship that has has uh, borne fruit for the town, and it's it's just a wonderful project. So, and, and it also includes um, the school. You know, the school kids use that all the time. So it's great. Thanks. I'm available for ribbon, cu ribbon cuttings. <laughs> 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 Other comments? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, moved, seconded. Uh, we've had discussion. All in favor of the motion? Show it to be unanimous. Thank you, Marzi, again. Thank you. Item number 23-2009, a proposed gift of easement from uh, Louise Sullivan. Uh, Mike, would you like to? Excuse yes. me. I'm sorry. I just uh, need to recuse myself or raise the issue of my recusal from the next agenda item. Uh, the Sullivans are represented by one of my partners, uh, Richard Chenet, and given that, I feel that I should recuse myself from consideration, and I'll let David Backer speak for himself. <laughs> Well, if my partner is recusing himself, <laughs> I probably need to recuse myself. I think. Uh, Anybody else from Drummond with some care? <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> we don't uh, have enough so counselors for you guys. No. To... Yeah, you do. Again. Does the council feel that uh, this is a proper uh, action at this time, Ann? I think uh -huh. if these two counselors feel they should recuse themselves, that the council should accept them recusing themselves. Okay. Do we need to uh, carry that through a vote? You should. Okay. Uh, all in favor of uh, accepting, their recusal. accepting the recusal of Councillor Sherman and Backer, uh, signify by saying it or raising their hand. Show it to be unanimous. Thank you for bringing that up, David and David. Uh, now I'll give it to the yes. town manager for a little introduction. And just as I do the introduction, uh, the, the woman in the third row, for those who might not know, is, is Louise Sullivan. Uh, I'd like to welcome you, Louise. Louise, uh, you may not all know, was the longtime children's librarian at the Thomas More Library as well, so it's good that you, you're with us this evening. Uh, Louise, uh, along with her husband, owns, uh, she's the owner of Record, uh, but they own property at 72 Two Lights Road, a beautiful old farmhouse with some acreage in the back, and it abuts the, the town Greenbelt path. Uh, they have uh, some animals back there. Uh, it's very pastoral, uh, beautiful spot. And they're interested in working with the town uh, to possibly have an easement over the back two acres that would preserve it uh, uh, for as, as open space, as an asset to the Green Belt, but would still have uh, their ability and subsequent owners' ability to use the, the back area for, for agricultural purposes, for purposes that lawyers would, would write the language, uh, Mr. Cheney, uh, to, uh, to accomplish. Uh, you know, this may or may not be done by the end of the year. Uh, it's, it's difficult to get things done in December, but there's always interest to do during the, by the end of the year. The Conservation Commission has looked at it. They've, they've approved it preliminarily. Uh, there's beginning to be some language discussed. Uh, they, uh, they, they are meeting between now and the end of the year. The, the, rec the recommendation that was on the agenda is to authorize me to accept the gift provided the final easement language is approved by the Conservation Commission. It, it may or may not happen this year. You know, there's issues that one of these year-end things that you, you need to go through. There's a survey still to be done and uh, appraisals, that type thing in the language. Uh, but that is the recommendation. It would be a, a, the Conservation Commission's preliminary indication is this is a, a real asset to the Green Belt in terms of uh, uh, it's the, the protection. Uh, that would that would involve there would be a, a benefit potentially to the uh, Sullivans with a, with a tax deduction. We do not believe, though, although it's ultimately up to the assessor, that it would substantially change the value of their prop of their property for for uh, assessing purposes. Uh, you know, so that I don't think we need to be overly concerned with the loss of tax revenue. There would be a slight change, but it wouldn't be a significant change without committing the assessor. Mr. Those Chair. are his determination, ultimately his determination. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Ann? I have a question for the manager. In this memo, um, in the last paragraph, uh, it says that there's going to be the possibility that the town will pay uh, for some work related to the easement. Yeah. And um, what I'm, my question is, is will this cost the town something? And if to do yeah. this, and how, if so, how much? Well, we've had discussions on the, the town sharing and the cost of the survey. Uh, the Sullivans would be responsible for all their attorney's costs. We would be assuming uh, the response for our attorney's cost. So it's just our attorney's cost? And in... the, the survey we would help out on as well. Usually if someone's giving us a, uh, 
a land or an easement, we will assume some of the, the soft cost result of it. We don't assume, we generally don't assume, and we wouldn't, we have not often in this case, any of the legal fees uh, for the Sullivans. Once in a while, we, we have assumed the legal fees for other parties, but it's usually when we're approaching them mm -hmm. to give us something as opposed to them approaching us. And do you have an estimate just of the order of magnitude? $1,600 for the survey, and our legal bills, you know, depending, you know, it's 175 an hour, or whatever Leahy charges us now, and I would guess, you know, under $1,000, okay. well under 1000 Okay. Thank you. Paul? I move that we authorize the town manager to accept the gift of the easement provided. The final easement language is approved by the Conservation Commission uh, for the gift or, or the easement uh, from uh, Dr. and Dr. Richard and Louise Sullivan of 72 Two Lights Road. Second. Moved by Councilor McKenney, seconded by Councilor Swift Cat. Yeah. See if Louise wanted to say anything. Hmm? Did Louise want to say anything? Louise, did you have something you wanted to say? Why not? Uh, okay. You know, we've, uh, from, we've lived on the Cape here for 32 years and lived in that farmhouse for 21 of those years. And it has been a great privilege to live in that house and to have a sense of living in one of Cape Elizabeth's historic houses. It was an old Jordan farmhouse, one of the original ones. And grew um, from two rooms around the central chimney to the house that it is today. And, and the land, um, as it is, we have become, I guess, more and more aware of um, Cable's this beautiful uh, farming heritage. And that is what moves us to want to preserve this so that that field will always go with that house as, as a part of, of our town history. And that's why we want to do it. Wonderful. It's a noble thought. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's nice to put the green belt behind and on the side, you know, and so it, it does. There's this wonderful communication with Brian Cole, and lots of, lots of people use that trail, and then the, the trail that the town has developed through the woods connecting to a bigger um, trail system behind is, is also well used and very beautiful. Certainly is. Thank you. Another ribbon cutting. Yeah, another ribbon cutting. <laughs> 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 this guy's looking for opportunities. <laughs> so you want to vote? Uh, I just want to oh, sorry, sorry. echo everyone's sentiments and thank you for the generous offer. That's wonderful. Uh, we have a motion seconded. We've had our discussion. All in favor of the motion? Show it to be unanimous. Four zero. Thank you again. And uh, we welcome back our Councillor Davids. Councillor David. <laughs> Item 24 2009 Fort Williams Park Use Policy. Fort Williams Advisory Commission has recommended amendments to the Fort Williams Park Group uh, use policy regarding weddings and other ceremonies. Uh, we have those in our packets. On the last sheet. On the last sheet. Move the amendments. The amendments have been moved. Second. Seconded. Discussion on the motion. Seeing none, all in favor of the recommendations. One more time, please. All in favor of the recommendations? Okay, thank you, unanimous. Item 25-2009, acceptance of 2008 gifts and donations. Uh, each year, the town council uh, receives a number of gifts from money and donation of services. They're formally accepted each December with appreciation to the generous donors, and we have a list of those gifts and donations uh, in our packets. Uh, I won't read down through the full list. Are there some you would like to mention in particular? I, I, no, I, they, they're all great, but I want to thank Deborah Lane for putting together the, the list once again. Thank you, Deb. Uh, 
Do I have a motion? Ann? Move to gratefully accept the gifts. Second. Moved by Councilor Swift Kayada, seconded by Councilor McKenney. Discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Unanimous. 6 0. And I would echo the thanks of the town and, and the council for those gifts. Uh, as Mike said in his presentation earlier, it takes. Uh, takes a lot of private effort, effort uh, along with the public good uh, to make things happen in, in any municipality and, and these are gratefully received. Council, uh, yeah, council, uh, item 26-2009, uh, update from the town manager on allowing citizen credit card use. Mike, yeah. This would not change whether or not citizens can use credit cards. It's just whether or not they can use it to, to buy certain <laughs> municipal services, pay for certain municipal services. Uh, you know, it sounds, it sounds like a great idea, but as Maine law now stands, it, you know, the town has to pay for the fee. There's, there's some attempts to try to, you know, through, through other mechanisms to not have the fees paid. But, you know, Deb had a working group that met how many times, would you guess? Probably at least a half a dozen. Half a dozen times, mostly earlier in the year. We just wrapped up the report actually now. But, you know, it, it, if, if people use them to the degree that we would anticipate them using them, uh, avail themselves the opportunity, the town would be paying credit card fees of $500,000. So instead of a half million dollar challenge, as I explained earlier, we'd have a million dollar <laughs> challenge. And, you know, it's, it sounds like a wonderful thing. And there are some areas would be very useful to use and we'll be continuing to explore them. But the staff recommendation at this point is uh, that there are clear budget implications in accepting either credit cards or debit cards, and has recommended the consideration of expanding the availability of the use of credit card and debit cards for municipal transactions be deferred until the budget process for FY 2011. Notice this is not 2010. It's uh, 2011 is the recommendation. Yeah. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we acknowledge receipt of the report, but would it be in order to accept the recommendation of the staff to uh, defer further discussion on this until the budget process for fiscal 11? Seems to me it would be in order. Then that's part of my motion. And that is her motion. Second motion. Moved by Councilor swift Gayata, seconded by Councilor McKenney. Uh, discussion on the two-part motion. David? I, it's my understanding, Mike, that the town cannot pass along the credit card charges to the consumer uh, as things stand now? That's a belief, but there's, there, there's not a definitive judgment on that. There really needs to be legislation to address that issue. Okay. There's mixed opinion on it, and we don't want to start charging it and then get an adverse decision and yes. right. have an unexpected bill. Right, I, and I'm certainly not moving in a different direction, but I, I just wonder if we, we ought to be deferring to 2011 in the event that this issue were to be addressed sooner than that, we might want to reconsider. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we'd bring it back earlier if that was the case. So that the motion that would Anna's made wouldn't that. preclude that? Okay. It doesn't prohibit discussion. Okay. Yeah. Further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Unanimous. Yeah. Uh, item 27-2009, update from the town manager on disaster recovery plan. This came out of our uh, town audit. And uh, Mike, would you speak to this, please? Yeah, it, it's, this is a very valuable recommendation that was made by the auditors both last year and this year to come up with disaster recovery plans. Uh, and, you, you know, there's issues of, you know, where you relocate certain activities if, uh, if you know this place had a calamity or whatever, but the the, re the real worry and the real danger is the backup of all the the, the data. Uh, and Gary Lenoy has been particularly helpful, and we're continuing to study it. And all the department heads are being asked to uh, have a requirement that everything be backed up at least weekly, off-site. And you know, we're even looking at services where you can upload stuff and back it up that way. And, there may be a little bit of budget implication for it, but the expense is tremendous if you lost a lot of data. Or most of the, the routine expense. business is backed up. I, I don't want to, you know, to make people worry needlessly. But when I say routine, it's the financial stuff. What's not backed up, like all my, my files are backed up on a server, but yet that server isn't backed up off-site. Hmm. And uh, 
we need to make sure to address things. The specific plans we're not sharing for each department because uh, it, it discloses lots of information that we'd rather not have out there. And there's a specific exemption in the, in the main Freedom of Information uh, law, Title I, that exempts uh, recovery plans from dealing with, with disasters or, or you know, terrorist acts, that type of thing. You, don't wanna, you just don't want to disclose all that stuff. Mm -hmm. We have a uh, proposal in our packet that uh, we acknowledge receipt of the report. Um, would somebody like to put that in the form of a motion? Dave? I move that we acknowledge receipt of the town manager's report on the disaster recovery plan. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion on the motion. Seeing none, uh, all in favor of the motion. Once again, unanimous. Uh, we have an opportunity for citizens. Forget it. Uh, I accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion to adjourn. Uh, so moved and seconded. Before we take the vote on that, I would like to uh, announce the future meetings. Uh, the town council workshop uh, is scheduled for Tuesday, January 6, 2009, at 7:30 p.m. Uh, items to be discussed were discussed earlier tonight. And the next town, regular town council meeting for January is on Monday, January 12th. So all in favor of adjourning? Mr. Mr. Chair, Chair. Uh, could I note that I believe that January 6th meeting, workshop meeting, is also a finance committee meeting. Duly noted. Thank you. Um, anything else? Um, a question. Is that January 6th meeting a joint meeting with the school board? No. No. Uh, no. We are, no, we're, we're inviting our uh, legislators, legislative delegation to appear, and we'll also be discussing some of the budget items and uh, also recycling. Yeah. Well, we'll let this, particularly if the legislators are able to come, we'll let the school board know. It, it's, it's open to the public, so I mean, anybody. We'll specifically invite them if the legislature. Right. It's not a scheduled joint workshop per se, though. And, and, and you do have the item on there to consider the the, the suggestion mm -hmm. about the, the two hundred thousand dollars suggestion. So the right. school board might want to be there. We can we can make sure they were alert. Them on it. Yeah. But it's mostly a discussion of the budget, the upcoming budget. It's all those things. Yeah. They're all tied together. Yeah. Well, in past years, in early January, we've had a joint meeting with the school yeah. board. Are we not having that this year? No. Although this one, is not that traditional meeting. Although there is leadership our town meeting. council, there is a leadership meeting, if leadership, yeah, such as we are, right? Um, Jim and I will be meeting with Trish and Kathy in a couple, nice if, if, they, if they are elected the chair and the finance chair. We'll be meeting with whoever the school board chair and finance chair will be. Um, but what I was going to say was there, um, it, it, one of our town council goals is to have a, a joint working with the, ta with the school board to set financial targets. So there may well be, I would imagine, I'm just speculating, some sort of joint meeting later than that January 6th meeting. It's been, it's been difficult the last hard to month to deal with meetings. The, the school department because they have not elected their leadership yet, and it's made it real awkward to. Yes, try I was to just anything. speculating. When do they ago. do that? Uh, they were they ever get a meeting? Anyone remember on the calendar? Probably tomorrow. I don't know. Yeah, It'll be tomorrow. They've got a couple of meetings. They're having a retreat. They had their regular meeting last week. Yeah, they have a retreat on Friday, I think, of this week maybe. So maybe they're having a caucus. I think Friday this week, I think it is. So I was just guessing. Anything else before we do vote? We have a motion and a second to adjourn. So all in favor? We are adjourned at uh, 940. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jim. Sure. A lot of stuff on that. That was. Do you want to sign those letters? Or do you want to a lot and Thank you. Thank you very much.